Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felding. Okay, it's good to see everybody in on kind of a chilly day in Oklahoma, but we're glad that you braved it and you're here, and uh, we just appreciate so much that you folks here in the Tulsa area come in and uh, comfort us with your being here because it's the only way I can teach. And again, we always like to remind our television audience how we do appreciate your letters and your prayers and on behalf. And speaking of prayer, you remember in one of my recent programs, I mentioned that the young red-haired lady that always sits here in my front row was fighting brain cancer and she's been gone about two months and Sharon is back with us today. And uh, we want our whole national television audience to know how she appreciates your prayers. After that went on the air, she actually had contact from people out there. So uh, when I saw her today, I said, well, I just better let the audience know that Sharon is back. And uh, she's not over the hill. She's not out of the woods. She still has to uh, take some chemo. But we just praise the Lord because she has meant so much to the ministry. She's the one that did uh, the closed captioning and so forth. All right, we're going to... Uh, Pick right up where we left off in our last program, which for those of you here were a couple, three weeks ago, but for those of you on television, it was just a week ago. And uh, we're going to jump in at Matthew chapter 9, and we're just going to review a little bit before we carry on from where we left off, because uh, I see it more and more all the time. You've got to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. So I'm not going to apologize for it. We just covered this, but I'm going to repeat it just to uh, remind everybody where we're coming from. All right, that'd be in Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to start reading in verse 35, and then we're going to skip right over to chapter 10 in verses 5 and 6. All right, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease, not just one here and there, but every sickness and every disease among the people. All right, now as you come down into chapter 10 then, he chooses the 12 disciples, and we don't have to read those names, but you can just jump across then to chapter 10, verse 5. Chapter 10, verse 5, these 12, now remember this at the onset of his earthly ministry, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, that's the key word, he commanded them saying, go not, and I have to emphasize that, go not into the way of the Gentiles, any city of the Samaritans, enter you not, but... Instead of going to Gentiles, you go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what the Word of God says. Now, that is as plain as language can make it. You don't go that way, you go that way. There's no making up your mind. You do what I tell you. All right? Now, we know what happened after the three years of earthly ministry. The nation of Israel rejected it all brought about the crucifixion, which, of course, had to happen. And then Peter and the eleven, even after Judas is gone and they replace him with Matthias, they too continue on with that same message, the same signs and wonders and miracles. Only difference is now Christ has ascended back into glory. But their operation, the modus operandi, stays the same. They're still preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They're still hoping to convince the nation of Israel that the one they crucified was indeed the Christ. Repent of it. Believe that he's alive. He's been raised from the dead. He's gone back to glory, but he's going to come very soon and still fulfill all the Old Testament covenants and promises. But, you see, God had something else on his mind which was totally, totally secret to every other writer of Scripture. You cannot find anything of this anywhere in the Old Testament, in the Gospels, or Acts, or Revelation, or anybody else, because God is now going to take the opposite tack. And that's in Acts chapter 9, where we were probably just a few programs back, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. 
Acts chapter 9, and he's just experienced the horrendous meeting of the Lord out there on the road, and I think it left him physically devastated. He was blind. He was probably dehydrated. He was famished, and he actually needed physical help to get into the city of Damascus. But while his friends are helping him along the way, God leapfrogs into the city and approaches one of those believing Jews who no doubt old Saul of Tarsus had on his list to arrest and take back to Jerusalem. All right, so now we're going to come in in Acts chapter 10, just uh, Acts chapter 9, just for sake of review now. And uh, verse 10, where the Lord says, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord, and the Lord. Now remember, where is the Lord? In heaven. He's ascended. So we're dealing with the crucified, buried, risen, and ascended Lord from glory. And he says, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight, inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. He still hasn't gotten over that tremendous experience out there on the road. All right, and he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So he says, Saul knows you're coming. All right, now look at Ananias' response. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints or those believing Jews at Jerusalem. You know the account, how that he arrested them, threw them into prison, and if possible, put them to death, persecuted them without end. All right, and now Ananias is rehearsing all that to the Lord. And now he says, here he is in Damascus. And he has authority from the chief priest to bind or arrest all that call on thy name. In other words, Jews who were embracing Jesus as the Messiah, which was contrary to Orthodox Judaism. All right, but now here's the verse we come for. But the Lord said, from heaven, go thy way. For he, this Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. Now, what's the point I'm making? Back three years ago, the Lord told the twelve, go not to the Gentiles, go only to the house of Israel. Now, these three some years later, it's, well, it's a little more than three years later. It's about uh, three, almost seven years after Pentecost, I'm sorry, seven, eight years later, now God is going to let Israel go, and he sends this man to the Gentile. And that's the point I try to make over the phone with people. They just, they never hear it in church. They never hear it taught in Sunday school. But here you have two direct opposite commandments, not a contradiction, it's a change of program. He tells the twelve, go not to the Gentiles. He tells this man, you're going to go to the Gentile. Okay, now that can bring us up to where we left off in our last taping, in the last program. And now I want you to jump over with me to Galatians chapter 1. Because this is so hard for people to see, especially theologians and Bible teachers and preachers. They just can't see that here we have two totally different programs. I read it, I hear it. Well, there's nothing different. Paul just preached the same thing, only in a little different atmosphere. Peter and Paul never had any difference of opinion. They all preached the same thing. No, they did not. You remember my last program, I put on the statement from Lewis Berry Chafer. My, I hope people will cut that out and pin it on the wall where he said exactly what I say. The gospel of the kingdom was God's offer of salvation to the nation of Israel based on his messiahship. Under the law, nothing had changed. The temple was operating. But to this man, this new apostle, this new direction, he is now not offering the gospel of the kingdom, but the gospel of the grace of God, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as Sperry Chafer said in that statement, I put on the screen. What an absurdity to try to say that the Pauline gospel of death, burial, and resurrection is no different from the kingdom gospel, which was before the cross ever happened. And they didn't know he was going to go to the cross. 
How could they preach it? Well, they couldn't and they didn't, see? All right, so that's what we have to constantly point out. All right, now then coming over to Galatians chapter 1, still a review from the last program. Verse 11, where now Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is God's word just as much as what the Lord himself said in red back in the Gospels. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, that is, by other men, but by the revelation or a revealing from Jesus Christ. And never forget, where is he? In glory. So from glory, God supernaturally, through the work of the Holy Spirit, however you want to do it, revealed to this man this whole new modus operandi, is what I like to call it. All right, now verse 13, for we have heard, you have heard of my conversation or manner living in past in the Jews' religion. How beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, which was the Jewish church at Jerusalem, and these Jewish believers wasted it, destroyed it. Verse 14, profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals of my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of the fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. My, the man didn't deserve it. He hadn't worked for it, but it was all of grace. And what was the purpose? To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. And immediately, now it wasn't within the next five minutes, but within the next few days, I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia. All right, now I'm going to stop right there. If Paul is preaching the same thing that Jesus and the twelve preached, then why does the Holy Spirit inspire the apostle to say that I conferred not with flesh and blood? Why did Jesus make sure that this man would have nothing to do with those 12 men down there in Jerusalem? He wasn't going to get it all mixed up because he was going to come out with something totally different that these men knew nothing of. And so everything, if you watch the scripture, everything is done to keep Paul from them until he's established enough that now he can go back and uh, compare notes with them. All right, now then, keep your hand in Galatians. We're going to come right back, but back up again to Acts chapter 9. And this is still a little review. <clears throat> when we find that after Saul of Tarsus plays his hand, recognizes that now he is indeed a believer that Jesus was the Messiah. Again, the Orthodox Jews of Damascus were in a dither, and uh, they only had one object, and that was to get rid of him. All right, so now then you come down to verse 20 and 21 of Acts chapter 9. After he's come through that experience on the road, he's been baptized according to the kingdom operation because that's what saved him. He didn't yet believe in a death, burial, and resurrection. All he believed that this Jesus that he thought he hated was indeed the Christ. Don't lose that. That's the basis of his salvation. So he has to still come through the baptism bit. So after he's baptized, he went straightway, verse 20, preaching Christ in the synagogues. Well, that's not what God intended. God intended him to go where? To the Gentile. See? But you see, he's still adhering to that Jewish mindset that he had to prove to Israel that Jesus was the Christ, which is what he'd been hearing for three years while he was up there in Israel. All right, so now he's continuing on that same line, that Jesus was the Christ and that Israel had to believe that. All right, verse 21, all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem? And they came hither, that is, up to Damascus, for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. But as a result of that conversion out there on the road, Saul increased the more in strength, confounded the Jews who dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. 
Not a word about the death, burial, and resurrection. Not a word about the cross. Still on that same premise that Jesus of Nazareth was that promised Messiah. Now, you see, in God's providence and in God's miraculous power, he could have just simply done with Saul like he did with uh, Philip, I think, back there with the Ethiopian eunuch. Here he was on the road down to Ethiopia, and the next minute you know, he's up there at Azotus back in Israel. I think God just picked him up and set him down. Well, why didn't he do that with Saul of Tarsus? Well, you see, God operates on two different levels. Sometimes he will do the supernatural. But most generally, he uses common circumstances to get people where he wants them. That's true of every one of us, I'm sure. We all where we are spiritually because God has just simply maneuvered us by one event, another, closed doors, open doors, and here we are, just exactly where God wants us. Every one of you, whether you know it or not. All right, so now God isn't going to do the supernatural. He's not going to just lift Saul up and set him down in the desert. He's going to use circumstances. And what is it? They're going to threaten his life. Okay, now let's read on. After many days, in verse 23, were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him, but their laying await was known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And they thought that if he would try to escape Damascus, they'd be able to nab him and put him to death, and that would end it. But, you see, after they got aware of this conspiracy to kill him, his friends now, these believing Jews, as they're called disciples, in verse 25, took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. All right, now as we said when we taped last time, there is a gap here of time between verse 25 and 26 because we know he did not go from that basket experience in Damascus right back to Jerusalem because that was the last thing God wanted. He did not want him to have contact with the 12. All right, so then that's why we got to flip right back to Galatians chapter 1 that after they led him down in the wall, let him down the wall in a basket. What happened? All right, here it is. Verse 17. Verse 17. He didn't do the logical. Neither, he said, did I go up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me, which, like I said in the last program now, that would have been the logical. Go back and ask the twelve. Tell me everything about this Jesus that you know. But no, that's not God's way. So now God providentially gets him out of Damascus and evidently picks up with some kind of a supernatural way of taking him down into the desert of Arabia. See, reading on in verse 17. I did not go to them who were Paul's before him, but I went into Arabia, returned again to Damascus, I think because that's where the primary trade routes were, from Damascus up over the Golan Heights, down around the north end of the Sea of Galilee, and down into what is present-day Megiddo, and then over the Mediterranean Sea, and down to Egypt. That was the major trade routes from the Far East, see? So that's why I think he goes from that desert experience in Arabia back to Damascus. All right, now then the next verse is what we have to do uh, is just use common sense. It does not specifically say that he spent the three years in the desert, but it almost makes it sound like he spent the three years in Damascus. And let's read it so you'll know what I'm talking about. Verse 17, the last half, I went into Arabia, returned again to Damascus, and then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter in abode in 15 days. All right, now what am I trying to do? There was a three-year period of time there from the time he was let down in the basket until he finally goes back to Jerusalem by way of Damascus. Now, you've got to know your Middle Eastern geography, Mount Sinai, where, again, I didn't take the time to do that. Do that right now. Turn on over to chapter 4 in Galatians, and here's where I get the scriptural concept that he went not just into the desert someplace, but that he went down to Mount Sinai. Otherwise, I don't see why the Holy Spirit led him to use the term right here just a couple chapters later. But in Galatians chapter 4, when he's speaking of the law and grace allegory between Isaac and Ishmael, he uses, verse 24, he uses this allegory to bring out what I think is a scriptural point. And that is, in verse 
25. For this Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, who in the allegory are the pictures of law, which was of the flesh. It was fleshly. It was powerless. Isaac, on the other hand, is the picture of the spiritual, where we are. All right? But that's not the point I want to make. I want to make the point of geography. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai, where? In Arabia. See? Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now, why would that be put in here if it was not a little feedback on what Paul is talking about, that he went into Arabia? And so I've taught it for years that I think the Lord led him down to Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia. And for three years, he had a person-to-person -person relationship with Saul of Tarsus, unveiling all these things that had never been revealed before. And that's the whole object of Paul's doctrines, that they were never, ever revealed any other place in Scripture until God gave it to him. Now, I'm sure he didn't get everything in those three years, but he got enough that it set him apart from Judaism and where he could make the statement, statement in Romans 6, verse 14, what? You're not under law, you're under grace, see? All right, so now then, after these three years, it says he went up to Jerusalem. So now the question comes every once in a while from the TV audience. Well, did he spend the three years in Damascus? Well, I can't just adamantly say no way because it doesn't speak of it that way. But logically, logically, had Paul spent three years in Damascus, what would he have left behind? Evidence. There would have been congregations in that city, more than one. But were there? Not a one. Nothing. You never, ever in Scripture see that Paul or Saul left behind any kind of a group of believers in Damascus. So on that basis, I maintain, no, he didn't spend that three years in Damascus. He meant the three years in the desert in the presence of the Lord. And then I have another reason. You know, when uh, Paul was in his ministry, especially amongst the Corinthians, they were always downgrading his authority, his apostleship. And what would they compare him? Well, we can believe Peter. We can believe Jesus. But who are you? Well, you see, with this three-year experience behind him, I think he could come back and he says, well, sure, you had three years with the Lord, but so did I. And the Lord just leveled the playing field. So those are my, my reasons of assumption. Like I say, it's just uh, something that I can't point and say, this is what the book says, like I normally do. But on the other hand, you've got to figure some of these things out with common sense, that he did not spend those three years in Damascus for nothing, but he must have spent that whole three-year time in the presence of the Lord, where he revealed unto him these glorious, glorious gospel of grace truths. All right, now then I think we might as well finish the chapter here in Galatians 1, and then we're going to run back to Acts a minute. So verse 18 again, after three years I went up to Jerusalem. Now that'll fill the gap back there in 9 before between 25 and 26. I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and bowed with him 15 days, but other the apostles I saw none except James, the Lord's brother, Verse 20, Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, those Jewish congregations. But they had heard only that he who persecuted them in the time past now preached the faith which he once destroyed. All right, now I'm going to go to the timeline up here for just a little bit and review this as well. From Abraham to Moses to David to the... Uh, Babylonian captivities and the appearance of the prophets of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel and all the rest of them, leading us up to Christ's earthly ministry. Then we begin that three years. He's rejected. He's crucified. He's ascended back to glory. Now, so far as all of these prophecies were concerned, they were to expect shortly the tribulation to come in, that would trigger the second coming, and in would come all the fulfilled prophecies from back here in the Old Testament in the form of the kingdom. But, unknown to all of Scripture, and I can't emphasize that enough, nowhere 
Nowhere in our Bible do we have any indication that God was not going to finish everything with that top line. But here in Acts, when we have the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, and we have that specific instruction, don't go this way, you go that way, now God opens up something that is entirely new and different, and you can't find one word, not one word, in the four Gospels, in the Old Testament, or Revelation, or any place else. It's a closed body of truth that we're going to be looking at the rest of the afternoon. All right, so now then, and when you come back to Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, instead of the tribulation coming in, as Israel was expecting, God now does something different, and the whole Jewish kingdom program is going to fall through the cracks as Paul's ministry takes the ascending role. So back to Acts chapter 9, and... Uh, at that point now where uh, they let him down to the basket in verse 25. Now in verse 26, we pick it up after that three years that we just read about in Galatians. And so now, as Paul said, he meets with Peter for the first time. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed or attempted to join himself to the disciples, that is, to those Jewish believers now gathered around Jerusalem ever since Pentecost that we talked about last time. But they were all afraid of him. My, they all heard what a vicious persecutor he had been. And they believed not that he was now a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared to them how he had seen the Lord in the way and rehearsed his whole Damascus Road experience. All right, now then in verse 30, in the seconds we have left, we'll see that now there was such a hatred again rising about this new apostle that they had to get him out of Jerusalem and they take him up to Caesarea and they send him forth to Tarsus. What was Tarsus? His hometown. And so he heads up into Gentile territory north of present-day Lebanon, up into southwestern Turkey in our present-day geography, and there he will begin his ministry in his own hometown. And then from there on, we'll pick it up in our next program. But here is where you have that change of direction. Instead of going to Israel, God is now going to go to the Gentile world. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.